Panama Canal, one of man's greatest engineering achievements, was a dream as old as Balboa's discovery of the Pacific Ocean. For countless thousands of people, it was a great adventure. For others, it was a graveyard of men and reputations. Its actual construction would take over 40 years, and during that time, the world's attention would be riveted to that narrow barrier of land which separated the Atlantic from the Pacific. Men, nations, and technology would be pitted against the climate, disease, and terrain of Panama in a struggle that was as dramatic and costly as any war. The first most important step was the building of the Panama Railroad in 1855. The construction of the canal itself over a half century later would be dependent upon the existence of this railroad to transport not only men, but endless tons of earth and machinery. How many workers died building this tiny stretch of track is unknown, but it was a terrible figure that belonged to the Dark Ages. The French Canal Company, headed by the magnetic and influential Count Ferdinand de Lesseps, was the first to attempt the gigantic task of constructing the Panama Canal. Fresh from the triumph of building the Suez Canal in the 1860s, de Lesseps was revered as a hero by the people of France. With his beautiful young wife and 12 children, he projected a white-haired vision of perseverance and genius, as well as fertility. To do the final survey, he brought with him to Panama a commission of internationally famous engineers. Soon, from company headquarters in Panama City, the French began the canal, which despite a valiant effort, was doomed to failure. Under de Lesseps, more than 2,000 buildings would be constructed, and more than two-fifths of the canal would be actually completed. However, de Lesseps was more a flamboyant visionary than a skilled realist, and he was surrounded by the utmost corruption, graft, dishonesty, and waste. Furthermore, among the thousands upon thousands of workmen imported from all over the world for the project, the death rate was simply devastating. The French had the most modern hospitals known to man, yet it was almost a death sentence to be sent there. For as many as three out of four patients who entered these hospitals died. Since the mosquito had not yet been identified by science as the major enemy, malaria and yellow fever would kill 20 to 30,000 workers of all nationalities. Of 33 young Italian workers who arrived in 1885, 27 died during the first three weeks. Of 17 healthy French engineers, only one survived the first month. It was not only disease that defeated the French, it was also the sea level design of their canal. De Lesseps was initially dedicated to building a canal without locks, like his successful Suez. However, in mountainous Panama, the task of building a sea level canal without locks proved impossible even to the Americans a quarter of a century later. To add to the tragic health situation, money was running out, and morale was rapidly disintegrating. The sea level canal plan was abandoned in favor of a lock canal designed by Alexandre Gustave Eiffel, the most brilliant and prestigious engineer in France. But it was too late. By 1889, the French canal builders were mired in failure and bankruptcy, de Lesseps was branded a fool. Now another Frenchman, Philippe Bounot Varilla, stepped forward to consecrate his life to creating the Panama Canal. He had worked on the canal as a young man. Now in his middle years, he was obsessed with one single idea, to salvage French honor from the death grip of the jungle. A new Panama Canal company was formed, represented by the American lawyer, William Nelson Cromwell. The idea was to sell the French rights and property at Panama to the United States, and thus regain some of the enormous French financial losses. America, however, was not buying. Then came 1898 and the Spanish-American War. The U.S. sent the battleship Oregon from San Francisco to Spanish-held Cuba. The Oregon had to sail nearly 13,000 miles around the tip of South America and took over two months to get there. America promptly decided it needed a canal. 
Nicaragua was the favored spot. There was absolutely no desire to follow the disastrous French footsteps across Panama. It took four years and the timely eruption of a Nicaraguan volcano for Cromwell and Buno Varilla to sway American opinion. The French assets at Panama, valued at $109 million, were offered for a bargain basement price of $40 million. The new president, Theodore Roosevelt, liked that price. On June 19, 1902, the U.S. Senate followed Roosevelt's lead by voting the Panama route. Only the Colombians stood in the way. Panama was their province. They wanted part of the $40 million going to the French. A holdup, raised Roosevelt, a gouge by those bandits in Bogota. Many prominent Panamanians saw the canal as bringing prosperity to their province. The Colombian government was standing in the way. Revolutionary feeling began to swell. Buno Varilla leapt into action. From room 1162 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, the Frenchman organized every detail of the Panama Revolution. The revolution itself was both bloodless and brief. Within 48 hours, the U.S. gave de facto recognition to the new republic. Roosevelt sent in the Marines, and the Colombians were effectively blocked from confronting the revolutionists. The separate nation of Panama was born. Buno Varilla made his ceremonial first call to President Roosevelt that would give Panama legal status as a nation. Buno Varilla wore the uniform of Minister Plenipotentiary to the new Republic of Panama. Not a word was spoken in Spanish. Not a Panamanian was present. Absolutely determined that the American Congress would not reject his Panama Treaty, Buno Varilla drew up a new treaty irresistibly favorable to the United States. Reading the proposed concessions, Secretary of State Hay would hardly believe his eyes. He would write a few weeks later, we have here a treaty very advantageous to the United States, and we must admit, with what face we can muster, not so advantageous to Panama. A few days later, Congress met in Washington. Senator Mone of Mississippi would sum up congressional sentiment by saying, the treaty comes to us more liberal in its concessions to us, and giving us more than anybody in the chamber ever dreamed of having. In fact, it sounds very much as if we wrote it ourselves. The debates were long and heated, for the morality of the issue was a sore point of argument. Roosevelt would contend that the United States had a mandate from civilization to construct this canal. The people of the Isthmus, he asserted, rose literally as one man. Yes, and that one man was Roosevelt, retorted Senator Edward Carmack of Tennessee. John Tyler Morgan lamented, We have got too large to be just. When asked to prepare a defense for the American action at Panama, Roosevelt's own Attorney General Knox exclaimed, Oh, Mr. President, do not let so great an achievement suffer from any taint of legality. In spite of such opposition, the treaty was approved, and Roosevelt met publicly with Panama President Amador. Buno Varilla had served Panama to Roosevelt on a silver platter, a fact that the president would privately acknowledge. In doing so, the impassioned Buno Varilla had salvaged the dream of his beloved France. At last, there would be a Panama Canal. Between 1881 and 1904, there had been remarkable mechanical improvements in the machinery for excavation. From French bucket excavators to American steam shovels. Even more important for the Americans, medical science now had the theoretical knowledge to combat malaria and yellow fever. The first U.S. construction crews landed in the summer of 1904. Surely now the dirt would fly and the mountains would yield. They didn't. An unwieldy commission headed by Rear Admiral J.G. Walker attempted to oversee the construction from far off Washington. They first appointed John Wallace as chief engineer. Then they settled down to a year of bickering bureaucracy. By the end of that year, all was in shambles. 128 million had been spent, yet less soil had been excavated than the French had shoveled in a month. 
In the States, this appeared downright un-American. Wallace resigned. The commission also bungled by penny-pinching the canal's own sanitation department right into an epidemic. In 1904, Roosevelt appointed as chief sanitary officer Colonel William C. Gorgas, an army physician who had succeeded brilliantly in wiping out yellow fever in Havana, Cuba. Gorgas requested immediate screening of all windows in the canal zone. In Washington, the argumentative commission withheld money for the screening as well as other supplies. An outbreak of yellow fever was inevitable. It came, and the American workers panicked and fled. John F. Stevens was appointed chief engineer of the canal. Stevens stopped all construction and set about solving the problems of sanitation, housing, and disease. He gave full support to Gorgas and his sanitation force in the battle of yellow fever and malaria. Total war was declared on the mosquito. Swamps were drained. Ditches, ponds, cisterns, and cesspools were regularly coated with oil to kill the larva. Brigades were formed to fumigate all houses with burning sulfur to kill adult mosquitoes. These brigades also saw that screens were installed or repaired in every building. Quinine was administered to help prevent malaria. But most important, every person who contracted yellow fever was instantly and effectively screened. For it was now known that before a mosquito could act as a carrier, it had first to feed on the blood of an already infected patient. By January of 1906, yellow fever was totally wiped out from the Isthmus of Panama. At the onset of the mosquito campaign, more than eight out of 10 canal workers were suffering from malaria. By 1913, less than one out of 10 would feel its disabling effects. Malaria was never completely defeated in Panama, but Gorgas had dramatically reduced this debilitating and killing disease. Once medical problems at the canal site were brought under control, Stevens set about improving living conditions. For the 6,000 white North Americans employed at the canal, modern housing and facilities were built, as well as schools, clubhouses, post offices, and churches. Men were encouraged to send for their wives and families, or if unmarried, to find a wife at the first opportunity. Stevens provided the best of modern living in an equatorial wilderness, and the workers streamed into Panama. A workforce of some 50,000 people came from every part of the world, 97 countries according to the records. As with the French, the 30,000 unskilled pick and shovel workers were nearly all black men from the West Indies. They were not provided with the comforts given to the American workers. However, for the most part, life was better for them than they had known at home. Stevens had been a railroad man for his entire career. So he saw the building of the canal as simply an enormous problem in railroad freight. The railroad would be the lifeline of the canal project, moving men, machinery, food, and supplies. No motor trucks would be used at the sites. Everything would run on rails. Vast tons of dirt would need to be removed with the least possible wasted motion. To prepare for this, Stevens had the railroad overhauled and double-tracked he ordered movable track, locomotives, cars, unloaders, spreaders, and track shifters. He also ordered more than 100 giant steam shovels that would be hauled along the temporary track to do the actual digging. Up to this point, Stevens had assumed that he would be building the sea level canal recommended by Roosevelt's prestigious advisory board. Now, as he became more familiar with the ruggedness of the terrain, he saw any sea level plan for Panama as totally impractical. Stevens went to Washington to persuade the president, Congress, and Senate that a canal with locks would be vastly preferable. Swayed by his expertise, the government decided on June 21st, 1906, that Panama would be a lock canal. The concept was ingenious. The attempt to sever the isthmus by a slender trench would be abandoned. Instead, the building of a gigantic earthen dam at Gatun would hold back the Chagres River. Panama would be spanned by an enormous lake, which would not only create a navigable waterway,
but also provide a gravity-fed water supply for the operation of the locks. The only heavy excavation would be through the mountainous background of Panama at Culebra. Three sets of locks were necessary to move ships in a stair-step fashion to and from the 85-foot level of man-made Gatun Lake. Ships would leave one ocean, climb a flight of locks to reach the level of the lake, cross this artificial lake, and descend another set of locks to the other ocean. Theodore Roosevelt had placed the weight of his presidency behind the choice of this lock and let design for the canal. Roosevelt now came to Panama to see firsthand what he was creating. He rode the railroad, lunched at the mess hall, operated a steam shovel, and spoke to everyone he could. He returned to Washington thoroughly satisfied with the work of chief engineer John Stevens. Then, astonishingly, on the pinnacle of success, John Stevens resigned. Within weeks, Roosevelt announced, I am putting the canal in charge of men who will stay on the job until I get tired of having them there, or until I say they may abandon it. I shall turn it over to the Army. Roosevelt appointed George Washington Goethals, a model West Point officer whose career in the Corps of Engineers had been outstanding. He was a capable, correct, and dignified man who held demanding standards. The tenacious Army engineer was to complete the canal six months ahead of schedule and complete it at a cost savings of $23 million below the 1907 estimate. Gothels considered the nine-mile cut at Culebra to be the major point of attack. Colonel David Guillard of the Corps of Engineers was to carry the brunt of the responsibility for this difficult job. After his premature death in 1913, Culebra Cut would be renamed Guillard Cut in his honor. At the bottom of the excavations at Culebra, the smothering midday heat often soared to 130 degrees. Up to 60 steam shovels worked simultaneously along the nine mile cut, and 500 trainloads of spoil were removed daily. With depressing regularity, the endless rains turned the dig into a sucking mire. But the greatest of all technical problems were the slides. In Guillard's words, it was in fact a tropical glacier of mud instead of ice. As the cut grew deeper, the slides grew worse. There would be a total of 26 slides altogether, stopping construction for months. Huge cracks would appear at the rim of the cut. Weeks, months, or even years later, whole sections of slope would give way. The soft floor of the canal responded by buckling upwards, twisting tracks and overturning machinery. Tons of cement were pressed against the walls of the cut in an attempt to hold back the slides. Dynamite was rammed into holes, and the drama of Culebra was punctuated by thunderous explosions. Accidents happened. Hundreds of men were killed or horribly injured, blown to bits by dynamite or crushed by falling rock. Soon, Thousands upon thousands of tourists came from all over the world to watch this dramatic battle of man and mountain. In 1911, there were 15,000 of them. In 1912, the audience swelled to 20,000. In theatrical terms, the excavation at Culebra was a smash hit. President Taft came to see how the project was going. As Secretary of War under Roosevelt, Taft had made a total of five trips to Panama. When he stepped into the presidency in 1909, the canal was only half finished. On this, his first trip as president, he was well pleased with what he saw. Less spectacular, but equally important, was the work being done on both the Atlantic and Pacific shores. Slowly but steadily, the dry docks, wharves, and terminals grew. Breakwaters were built to hold back the silt and create safe anchorage for ships as they entered the approach channels of the canal. 
This was carried out by a fleet of dredges, many of them of French origin, and over a quarter of a century old. Meanwhile, inland on the Atlantic side, construction of the Gatun Dam began to create what was to become the largest man-made lake in the world. Once the first section of the dam was finished, the Chagres River backed up slowly, eventually covering 164 square miles of jungle. At the same time, the various locks began to take shape, which would effortlessly lift ships to the level of the future lake. It would take four years to build the three monumental sets of locks at Miraflores, Pedro Miguel, and Gatun. Each lock would be a huge concrete chamber closed at each end by steel gates. Concrete had never been used for anything so massive. Huge mixers churned to fill enormous buckets of concrete, each bucket holding nearly six tons. The buckets were swung through the air, then dumped into immense steel forms. Forms and towers would be moved ahead on tracks to the next position, where a new concrete monolith would slowly grow towards the sky. Concrete walls of each lock finally soared over six stories high and stretched almost five city blocks in length. To hold and control tons upon tons of water, the lock gates had to be enormous machines that would move with clockwork precision. The lock gates were constructed like a ship's hull, both hollow and watertight, and the buoyancy of water made these multi-ton giants virtually weightless. The beauty and simplicity of the canal would be water. Not only would it float the gates, it would lift and lower the ships. Falling water would generate the electrical current to run a multitude of innovative motors, including gate control and electric mules. And the only force needed to move this water was the force of gravity. As a safety precaution, all the locks of the canal would have double sets of gates, one behind another. So efficiently had the locks been built that they were completed almost a year ahead of schedule. Only the continuing slides at Culebra prevented the canal from being opened in 1913. On May 20th, Shovel number 222 and shovel number 230 met nose to nose on the bottom of the canal. The cut was now at 40 feet above sea level, as low as it was to go. On June 27th, the last spillway was closed at Gatun Dam, and the lake began its final rise. On September 26th at Gatun, the locks were tried for the first time. A tug named Gatun, which had been hauling mud barges, was cleaned up for the occasion. Decked in masses of fluttering flags, it made the slow and historic ascent through the Gatun locks before a crowd of several thousand. The locks worked perfectly. And then, on October 10th, in an act of high drama for 1913, President Woodrow Wilson pressed a button in Washington. The signal was relayed to Panama, and one minute later, the temporary earth dike at Gamboa was blown to smithereens. Instantly, water rushed through the opening left by the blast. Calibra Cut became a finger of Gatun Lake. Now the locks at Miraflores were supplied with water. Here, the tug clap at number six was the first boat through. Huge, awkward dredges were brought through the locks to finish removing the slides that still partially blocked the cut. There they labored undramatically for months as thousands upon thousands of canal construction workers packed and left for home. Canal administration buildings were rushed towards completion as great festivities were planned for the canal opening. But these were not to materialize. On August 3, 1914, a cement boat, the Cristobal, unofficially opened the Panama Canal with the first ocean-to-ocean -ocean passage. Standing on deck was the impassioned schemer Philippe Buno Varillard. He was there to witness the Americans realize the French dream of a canal at Panama. That same day, Germany declared war on France. 
When the ANCON performed the official grand opening 12 days later, newspaper headlines had turned to the First World War. The fantastic triumph of the Panama Canal had been relegated to history at the moment of its fulfillment. This gigantic national effort resulted in an engineering feat that was unequaled in its time. For the building of the Panama Canal was the moonshot of its era. However, the price was high. In terms of time, money, and lives, the Panama Canal had indeed become the longest shortcut.